thank you. Um, so we were interested in uh, muscle fatigue that occurs during sustained prolonged muscle contractions. And with repeated muscle activation, you get a decline in force. And that's shown here. Um, we have electrically stimulated during isometric contractions the muscles 60 times within two minutes. And there's a very clear decrease in the force that's, um, the external force that's produced, such that there's one second rest between each of these contractions, each one lasts um, one second itself. And at this, by the 60th contraction, the force is down to about 55% of the force from the first contraction. And there's also not shown here a slowing of the rate of contraction and a slowing of the rate of relaxation. And together, the slowing of contractile properties and the loss of force leads to a loss of muscle power um, that's quite dramatic. The same processes of um, altered contractile properties, reduced force of individual motor units, as well as um, slowing of the contractile properties of those motor units, is probably also happening during sustained isometric contractions. But it's concealed because the task here, um, these are data from an older man holding a sustained isometric knee extension at 50% of maximum force. Um, the fact that the task is to hold the contraction for as long as possible to match the target force conceals the changes that you can see to external force that were evident in the previous figure. Um, but towards the end of the contraction, you see there's a progressively increasing voluntary drive. Um, towards the very end, it, there's a really unpleasant sensation of fatigue. It's like a dull ache and a burning sensation from the active muscle. There's unsteadiness of the external force and eventually an inability to maintain this contraction to meet this target force and your subject just gives up. So we were interested in, in what happens here. Um, and we tried to identify and, and track individual motor units. That, that proved quite difficult, so I won't present the results here. There are various ways that the central nervous system can try to maintain performance in the face of the changing contractile properties. The first is motor unit rotation. In order to study that, you need to be able to track individual motor units throughout the, the fatiguing contraction. And th so so that, that's quite difficult. We haven't found out how to do that just yet in our setup. So we're going to quickly move on beyond this and we'll look at two other possibilities. Motor unit recruitment, which means that with continued contraction, you simply recruit more motor units. And motor unit rate coding. Um, you can increase the firing rate of active motor units or, or perhaps even decrease the firing rate of active motor units. So to study motor unit characteristics during the fatigue and contraction, we had a setup similar to this. Um, this is actually not a true reflection of what we did. The leg was fully extended, but that's the only photo that I had on my phone when preparing this, this slide. So we recruited 12 young men, average age about 25, they performed a dorsiflexion contraction at 25% of maximum strength, so simply pulling the foot, the toes, towards the upper body. And throughout the sustained contraction, blood flow was occluded by a cuff uh, across the thigh, the upper thigh, um, inflated to about 260 millimeters of mercury. We inserted an intramuscular concentric needle electrode around the motor point of tibialis anterior, and we had a surface electrode as well. Um, using a process called spike-triggered averaging, we matched the motor unit potentials to the surface representation to get a better indication of the, um, uh, the motor unit size. And from this, you can also calculate the root mean squared, um, which gives a general overview of motor unit, motor unit activity and firing rates as well. So this is what we did. I borrowed Matthew's um, data, um, raw data. Um, <coughs> but our subject performed first a 15 second contraction with no blood flow occlusion. Um, in this one minute rest, so that, that's baseline. In the one minute rest, we towards the end quickly inflated the cuff. And the subject was asked to hold the contraction at 25% of maximum strength for as long as possible. So this is an open-ended task. 
Towards the end, when it becomes unpleasant, we gave them lots of motivation. So do not stop, continue, carry on. Um, but ultimately, there's a point where they can't continue, and, and so they give up. At that point, um, there was then no voluntary drive to the muscle, but we kept the cuff inflated. So this lighter blue um, bar here represents a two-minute period where there was no voluntary drive, but the cuff was inflated, and at the end of each minute, the subjects performed 15-second sustained contraction at 25% of the original MVC, maximum strength. We then deflated the cuff, um, and one minute later, we tested motor unit recruitment again by getting them to contract at 25% of the original maximum strength. Hope that's clear. We'll go through it again quite slowly in a minute. Um, <coughs> here, um, the first figures, I'm just presenting the root mean squared from both the intramuscular recordings and the surface recordings, and they pretty much followed the same pattern. Um, the root mean squared gives an indication of overall motor unit activity. The, the first thing to point out is there's not very much response to the initial act of inflating the cuff. Motor unit activity is about the same. So from baseline to measurements taken um, just after the cuff was inflated. The subject then sustains the contraction for as long as possible and there's not very much increase in the root mean squared by the first half of the contraction, but by the end, the root mean squared is increased by about two to three fold. <coughs> At task failure, um, the subject stops, the, there's, there's no more voluntary drive, but the cuff remained inflated for two further minutes, and you can see that in this period, the muscle still acted as, as though it was fatigued, so um, occluding the blood flow with no aerobic recovery, maintaining the metabolic fatigue, keeps the muscle fatigued. And the subjects describe great difficulty performing these contractions to 25% of their baseline maximum strength. So it's like an MVC again, uh, a maximum effort, um, but the muscle happily recovers very quickly when blood flow is, uh, is restored. So moving on, um, using the, the needle data and identifying individual motor units, um, we, we captured about 45 motor units per sampling session overall. Um, once again, the first thing to point out is there's no immediate change no, in, in the response of motor units that are recruited just through the act of inflating the cuff. If we look just at the top figure for now, um, this represents the size of the recruited motor units. Throughout the first half, there's not very much change. The size of the motor units are pretty much stable. By task failure, the motor units that were recruited seem to be about up to threefold greater. Um, so there's, towards the end, um, a progressive increase in motor unit recruitment and recruitment of those larger motor units. Um, and this is pretty much a, a maximum effort at the end. Moving on to look at the, the firing rates, um, this is not a significant change here, so there's no immediate change um, in response to a inflating the cuff. By halfway through the sustained contraction, the firing rate of the motor units was significantly lower than it was at the beginning. So this is a decrease in the firing rates of the motor units that we were able to, to um, monitor here. By task failure, the firing rates of the motor unit motor units were not significantly different from those at the beginning in, in the fresh muscle. Despite the size of those units being up to threefold greater, you would actually expect these firing rates to be about 28 hertz. We haven't been able to identify the individual motor, motor units during maximum efforts, but other people have, and the published data reckon this should be about 28 hertz. So it seems to be significantly lower than, than you would expect. During the rested period, but with blood flow occlusion, and remember this is two minutes. Two minutes is quite a long time, actually. Within this two-minute period, you could probably begin 
and end your high intensity or sprint interval training program, your session for the day. So it's, it's, it's quite a long time. You see um, the size of the motor units recruited um, was still significantly higher than those at the beginning and firing rates were still lower than you would expect of these motor units that are recruited, uh, the, the larger motor units. Um, this recovers when the blood flow is released again. Um, not quite here with the firing rates. So to conclude, <clears throat> we think there's an initial decrease in firing rates and lower than expected firing rates of the large motor units at task failure. Um, the muscle re remained fatigued for as long as the blood flow was occluded. And these data are consistent with this notion of muscle wisdom, which suggests that the firing rates to active motor units adapts or is adjusted to meet the changing contractile properties of the active muscle. Um, so the changing contractile properties, you remember there's slowing of the rate of contraction and relaxation, and uh, there's potentiation of the active fibers as well. And last point, the recruitment of the large motor units seem to be quite a late event during this sustained contraction. So that's it. Uh, we thank uh, the MRC for funding our lab and Matt, Alex and Jess for doing the work. Thank you.